Today on the program, David Helgeson is here. He's the co-founder and CEO of Unity Technologies. They make all the video games that you love. Every single game that you love, they power. Or something like that. Tyler's here with some insights, and the Shark Tank is back. Stay tuned. This Week in Startups, right now. That's what it's all about, man. Hey, shit. Money is the root of all evil. How it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money Spend the money and defeat you yeah. Money is the root of all evil what? Funny how it feeds my people yeah. We ain't gonna live like equals Until we get the money Spend the money and defeat you Today's guest, David Helgeson Co-founder and CEO of Unity Technologies Ah, uh, welcome, welcome to this week in startups. We've got an amazing show. David Helgeson is here. He is the co-founder and CEO of Unity Technologies. They make the gaming engine, the 3D engine for all the games that you've been playing over the last year. Uh, and it's an incredibly, incredibly successful company. We're going to learn a lot about the video game industry uh, from that. And uh, we're also going to do a Shark Tank. People have been begging and begging for the Shark Tank to come back. I mean, we're actually thinking now that the ads are sold out, I think, till September, We've got three, four, five months of ads sold out typically. Now, maybe we'll go to three days a week and just do one episode that's Ask Jason and Shark Tank. Um, if you're interested in that, you should tweet and say, hey, do a third show every week. Um, and if you really want to get involved, I highly recommend you join the This Week in Startups back channel. Yes, the back channel. Twist list is what we previously called it. We're sort of calling it the back channel now because we have 70 people on an email list and they're producing this show. So the guests, the questions, everything is being uh, crowdsourced. Essentially, go to twistlist.co and uh, join the program. It's incredibly exciting and fun. As I've said on previous episodes, if you're depressed, if you're suffering from literal depression, join. Your depression's gonna go away. If you're too short, join. You're gonna grow six inches. Uh, all of these things are possible just by becoming a producer of the show. Uh, join in on the fun. If you're lonely, if you don't have any friends, you just join the list. You get seven. It's true, Tyler, right? right? For a guy who has not very many friends, you join, you're on the list, and now you have, you have a lot of friends, actually. Changed my life. Change your life, grow your hair back, yeah. grow six inches. Everything's yeah. possible. Lose 20 pounds. Yeah. If you, but only if you join the This Week in Startups back channel. Go to twistlist.co. Uh, it's been amazing to watch just 70 maniacs. It literally is like a, I, have my, I always wanted to have my own army, like my own samurai army. Now I've got like literally 70. It's, it's like the original Star Wars Clone Wars, I mean, except with the plot and stuff. But I actually have like 70 Jedi running around the galaxy doing stuff. Ripping people apart, cutting arms off, Jedi mind tricks all over the planet. It's awesome. The stuff they have going on is incredible. Uh, so go ahead and join. And it feels more like Smurfs to me, but okay. Okay, whatever. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, and uh, uh, thank you to Trotta for sponsoring the program. Uh, everybody knows Trotta is a crowdsourced pay-per-click marketplace, uh, and they're making online advertising easy for startups and entrepreneurs. Interestingly, one of the viewers of the show, his name is Craig Calder, he runs a marketing and consulting company, uh, and he says Trotta m helped him make crowdsourcing optimization easy to understand for his client. Uh, his, his client was Heidi Douse Designs, uh, the number one jewelry seller on the Home Shopping Network. Wow, that's kind of big. I mean, they move a lot of jewelry on there. So Heidi Douse Designs started using Trotta, and it boosted sales, and it helped to grow her emailing list tremendously. Craig says the support team at Trotta has been amazing, and Heidi is thrilled to have found a partner like Trotta on This Week in Startups. That's what it's all about. I told you, if you're looking to do marketing, if you need to buy pay-per-click, you don't need to build your own department. You don't need to hire an SEM. You just outsource that to Trotta. To Trotta. I gotta, I'll never get that right. Is it over my left shoulder, my right shoulder? Anyway, Trotta, Trotta, Trotta. Uh, they are doing a great job for us. And thank you to Craig uh, for sending um, one of his clients Heidi Douse Designs, the number one jewelry seller on Home Shopping Network, to Trotta and having such a great result, growing her mailing list. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and assume she's using MailChimp. Uh, on the program today, David Helgeson is here. Uh, he has created uh, an interactive 3D platform known as Unity, uh, and you may know it because games like Battlestar Galactica and the Marvel Superheroes uh, massively multiplayer online game um, were built on it. And um, I found out about this company because... Uh, our board member, Rolof Bota. I have to teach everybody how to say Rolof. I think you nailed it. Wow. That was yeah, everybody says Rolof Botha. It's Rolof Bota. Rolof Bota. If you spend more time in South Africa, you'll right. get it. Yeah. Rolof, right? R U E, like Ru, like more like a French street. Mm -hmm. Rolof Bota, like B O W T A. Rolof Bota. This is a video on how to say Rolof <laughs> Botha's name. It's Rolof Bota. Ru. 
Rudolf Botha. Rudolf Botha. Anyway, we have the same board member. I remember when he invested in your company, he was very excited about it. Tell me and tell the audience what is Unity Technologies. Sure. So, uh, <coughs> so Unity Technologies is a, um, a company that uh, creates this platform called Unity that a whole lot of people use to make uh, 3D video games, but also a whole bunch of other like 3D interactive experiences. Uh, we kind of go into almost all industries in one way or another. Um, and uh, you know, it's basically a uh, you know, there's a freemium model, there's a free version and a fifteen hundred dollar version. Uh, you can download it off our website, and uh, five hundred five hundred thousand people have done so in the last couple of years, and you know, used it to build cool stuff. Now, where are you from? I'm from Iceland originally. Iceland. Um, the company the got <laughs> say what? Iceland. That's the, that's where all the geothermal is. <laughs> yes, there are and some problems. And where all the the actual all the bond money went to die. <laughs> all, the, all the money in the world went to Iceland to die <laughs> because Pretty four much. bankers decided that they could leave <laughs> for themselves. Up. I mean, are you? And then the Icelandic banking system asked that it's uh, the, the, the dying wish of the Icelandic banking system was that its ashes be spread over Europe. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's pretty tough as an Icelandic person though to actually have to deal with this, right? I mean, it, it permeates the whole society to this day. It's pretty well. It's not as bad as you might think. People are actually still eating. You know, there's people, still people having jobs. Okay. It didn't. Uh, it wasn't like a zombie apocalypse. Kinds, no, there's, there's all kinds of problems with the currency. But I was not really in involved with it. I was living in Denmark when, ah. the, com when the company got started. Mm. Um, and then, uh, you know, we moved to, I, I moved to San Francisco uh, two years ago as we ah. raised the money right. uh, from Sequoia. So you were in Denmark running this 3D yeah. engine. Uh, and what? how did you get started doing that? Like, why did you build it? Were you in the video game industry before that? No, we were like three sort of, uh, you know, pretty good developers. Uh -huh. But really, like, with embarrassing a little experience in almost anything right <laughs> business or video games right. or well software in general right. um, but uh, but we had a passion for creating this technology and we started you know in a basement and, and you know the whole bit yeah um, and uh, after a couple of years of kind of just kind of creating tech without any goal we sort of realized that uh, we had this pretty cool engine and, and there were some really nice tools. So you were just around. hacking? We were just hacking at this point. This is and like, you were like making your own games? Was that uh, sort of the yeah, idea? Uh, yeah, we were going to make a whole bunch of different games and, and because they were so different we had to make this kind of generic tool that would kind of, mm. kind of solve all the problems for us. Right. Uh, so we were making this tool which was obviously not very good back then but was sort of showing some promise. And then we realized that you know we were probably more kind of passionate about the tech than really making the games ourselves. Right. Um, was it because also you weren't good at making the games and you were better <laughs> at the tech? Because a lot of times people have to make this decision. It's very Should true. I build a platform or should I build an engine? user experience you went platform exactly now did we made one game it was yeah. beautifully done right and uh, all of 2,000 people bought it really <laughs> yeah it was so horrible you were on a consumer basis you were a huge failure mm -hmm. but on a platform basis a huge success yeah well not not overnight but uh, yeah so so we had but you could tell from the platform that it was good y yeah it, it showed promise for yeah. sure um so 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 we looked at the market and we were like you know we were not going to be yet another company. Most most game technology is sold on a sort of enterprise model where you you know go out and do a multi million dollar deal and this and that and talk to the CEOs of different companies, and and we really like first of all we didn't think we would be successful with that right. because there was already kind of a red ocean there, um, but also we had to, we had the sense that you know that was not really doing anything cool for the world. I mean, just being yet another company lining up yeah. you know to you know knock your prices down or something is <laughs> no fun. Right. But uh, so, so we basically figured, like, asked ourselves, like, what, what's the opposite of that? And that's, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, democratic model where, you know, it's, you put it up, 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 you know, up, up on your website and you have a web, web store and people can just kind of download it. Yeah, right? self-serve, software as a service, freemium, it, all of these it, things. It sounds silly to call it modern, but it was kind of modern for that particular industry uh, at that It still is modern. Time. I mean, you look at Zendesk, <laughs> also another company from yes. Denmark. Great guys. Uh, great guys. Um, and was it, was, was software as a service something that hit Denmark at the same time? Because he was about the same time. Um, it's actually, we're, we don't actually have software as a service. It's actually like you buy the product. And you download but, it. Yeah. But yeah. Um, but it's downloading software as a service, right? Yeah, I guess. Or yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, same model. You could self-serve yes. software. Yeah. Let's um, call it. So, uh, and then, you know, we asked ourselves, like, you know, what's, and then we, you know, decided to use this word democratic because we figured, like, you know, we we're kind of democratizing something where, because when you give access, you know, um, when you kind of you know massively improve access to some kind of technology, yeah. um, weird stuff happens around it, right? Right. And, and it sort of has a has an effect beyond just you know making allowing the few people who were using it previously to get it cheaper. I think William Gibson said the street finds its own use for technology. What a beautiful thing to say. Yeah, he's yes. going to be much more no. eloquent than the two of us. Uh, <laughs> well, but not as Tyler, actually. But, uh, so anyway, yeah. you put so, it out so and people start making crazy stuff. So yeah. what does that mean? People start making um, like so. 
art well, projects or so yeah I mean so so initially like you know we nobody wanted it because it wasn't very good so we you know we had to sit in this kind of same basement uh, actually it was a small office by then yeah and, and kind of make it better right so that took basically two years hmm. so we launched you know five so almost exactly six years ago and then like come to 2007 people finally start getting it wow in, in two, years <laughs> two years in, um, the, in the meantime going the, like this basically uh, you know, with a little, a little blip for like here's, here's 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 you guys two years if you really zoom in and then two thousand sales <laughs> and then coming right back down. I mean, that basically was it. It's like a pulse. Boop, we have a pulse on the patient. <laughs> One pulse in two years. I mean, we were not getting paid, and it was a, yeah. kind of a. You Did know. you think of giving up? Um, getting a job? In retrospect, I'm not sure. What about your thought, partner? I'm, I'm sure we thought about it, but yeah. uh, we don't remember that. Yeah. So you don't even you didn't even consider shutting the company down because you were having no, fun. No, it, it was fun, and yeah. it sort of made sense, right? We're doing something, and, and you know, the, these few people that had bought the stuff and were using it, they were really passionate about it because they, well, they loved the tech. It was mm -hmm. really polished and nicely done. And they love the idea of mm -hmm. democratizing this. Right. And they actually, I think I can say they liked us. Right. Because we were pretty decent guys and we would support them on chat in the middle of the night and, you know, do these kind of things that you Customer do. Customer service you're. counts. Yes, we were pretty good at that. Yeah. Um, and um, so, um, you know, but, but when, you, when you sort of decide to kind of democratize a product or a piece of technology, you know, a whole bunch of stuff that is sort of dictated around it, right? Yeah. So first of all, like it dictates some business model for you, and we decided to go with this kind of. Actually, it wasn't quite freemium from the early days. It was like cheap and cheaper, mm -hmm. but then we went from like went to cheap and free. Ah. Um, after when we sort of dared after a couple of years. Yeah. Um, a few years. And what happened when you offered it free? Oh, it, it blew, blew up. Actually, actually, we we did it um, a year only a year and a half ago. Yeah. And uh, when we when we did that, you know, the eve of the uh, eve of that doing that, we had like thirteen thousand lifetime users, mm. which we thought was a huge number right and now it's well 500,000 right <laughs> so basically and life changes big time it, it, yeah so, so it was like yet another kind of crazy we hadn't seen, foreseen like how, how big a difference it would make but yeah it, it really did so uh, how did you wind up meeting Sequoia Capital were you out looking for um, a yeah. fund we were actually we had, decided, raising we had decided to raise money so so we were organically grown and you know basically profitable from the day when we started having revenue, <laughs> right? So, so until then, uh, around hundred hundred thousand dollars had got, had gone into the company from somebody's wow. father. Ah. Um, Plus two years of sweat equity. Uh, even more years, actually. Yeah. I mean, the development started in two thousand one, and we didn't launch yeah. until two thousand five. Wow. And then, feel like, well, it's a long we started story. this in high school, right? <laughs> it was, it was, yeah. Actually, one of us was in high school when yeah. he started. <laughs> awesome. So he's the youngest. He's our CTO. He's the most brilliant guy, of course. Um, but. Uh, so, but you know, growing a company organically, right? Um, even when you're profitable and things are kind of awesome, right? It's actually really frustrating, because um, well, you kind of have to, I don't know, uh, you kind of have to imagine a graph, you know, of growing revenues, and the ideal, um, you know, cost line for this for this company is the exact same, right? Right. You can't spend spend money you don't have, and also right. you don't want to sit on cash. Right. So, <clears throat> unfortunately, like if you're a careful guy like we are, uh, you want like you know initially maybe three months and later six and ideally like nine months of cash. Right. Just, just in case. Just in case. I mean, you can't really. I mean, if you're a responsible Economic person, crisis, right? And, you whatever. know, we have employees and customers and all this. Yeah. Uh, now, you know, if you in, in, imagine that sort of as the integral of the curve ahead of you. Right. Um, you know, that's a lot of money. Yeah. And it's only going to come if you're not if you don't raise from the delta between the cost line and the revenue line, right? Right. And and it just takes forever to save up. So you're it's just really holding back your growth. It sucks. It really sucks. So, yeah. so we decided to go out and raise money. Unfortunately, that decision was made as the financial crisis was like hitting the world. Right. So, uh, so two thousand eight. So, for it, it turned out that all the Danish VCs we were talking to didn't have money. There are Danish VCs. There are a few. Really? Um, How many? Actually, uh, t today, I, I, you know, I think there were like fifteen, and I think there's like more like three now. Wow. Um, and, and there's one that is actually really good called Sunstone. Um, uh -huh. And are they, do they have a fund, or is it just like one rich guy's parents' money? Oh, these are generally funds. Generally I mean, there, there are some private investors yeah. as well. We're not really well connected. So, so we started talking to some of these funds. Turned out they didn't have money. We started talk, talking to European funds. It was kind of slow going, and they sort of, they kind of... When you say they we didn't have money, they, they didn't have the ability to draw down the money? Yeah, there was actual, like, there was at least one of the firms we were talking to actually just didn't have cash. They really wanted to invest. Right. Uh, uh, two of them, actually. Right. Yeah. And that was during that time of 2008. People don't realize when, VCs, yeah. when people raise a VC fund of a billion dollars, they don't actually have the billion dollars in exactly. cash. They have the commitment of a billion dollars. They've got to actually go ask their limited partners for, for that money. Cash, yeah. And if they don't have it, they don't ask because they're scared <laughs> to ask. And at that point, people were scared to ask their limited partners for money for fear that the limited partners would say, no, of course. we don't have it, in which case they, the limited partners I don't know. lose their investment in the fund. 
I don't even know how. Is yeah. that how the rules go? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You basically uh, forfeit the money you've put in before. Oh, really? I was yeah. not aware. Okay. It's pretty hardcore. That must be a tough. Okay, anyway. That was my understanding of it. Yeah, sure. Well, yeah. maybe true. I've yeah. not heard such a thing yeah, before. Yeah. yeah. So, so we started talking to the European VCs. They kind of got it, but like didn't really see the big potential. Um, yeah. And then uh, we uh, we kind of incidentally met Sequoia. Uh, actually, huh. it was not incidental. I had met a woman called Diane Green, uh -huh. the founder of uh, VMware. Mm -hmm, sure. And, uh, she really liked what we were doing. And actually offered to be an angel investor, which which she is. Awesome. And uh, and uh, you know, but, but we wanted like a, a real VC because we were raising a big round and right. so on. Uh, and uh, so so she introduced us to Sequoia, and they they liked us a lot. Wow. I had this amazing meeting with with Rulof. <laughs> yeah. The first time I met him, actually, you know, I just explained the story. Um, and he, you know, got up and you know thanked me for coming. Yeah. And, yeah. and a week later, we had a term sheet from them. Wow, that fast. Yeah. And did you talk to any other VCs? Uh, yeah, we talked to a few others. We had yeah. a few other term sheets. I, I, actually, when I walked in there, I had a few term sheets in my back pocket. Ah. Uh, but uh, you know, Sequoia just moved really fast. They were the coolest guys. Yeah. Uh, you know, great terms, very clean terms. Yeah. And uh, just impressed us I in every tell, way. I always tell people, the top VC firms, not just Sequoia, but you, you have an Excel yes, or, of these, or yeah. a benchmark or Mark Andreessen, Andreessen Horowitz and Ben Horowitz, the top firms don't sweat the details. No. They just exactly. give you the terms you want. If they're going to do it, they're like, you know what? We've seen this before. If you want, they're not going to fight with you over these little edge cases. No, because it doesn't matter. They just it want, doesn't matter at the end of the, the day. Big, the big, at the big picture. Exactly. Then you get these like mid-market VCs. I can tell you because I've dealt with them. I've seen some really. And then they want terms. like to put all these little terms in it. I tell you, it's like falling in love with a beautiful woman. Like either you're all in, or you're not. But you can't have all these terms. You ever date a girl? who had all these conditions on being her boyfriend, Tyler. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? No, I stick with the A group. You stick with the generally, A group. You yeah. stay on the A list generally, of yeah. ladies. Uh -huh. But you know, <laughs> do you know what I'm talking about here? Yeah, absolutely. Like some I'm not talking about the girls, but I'm I just, guess the <laughs> I'm sure, listen, it's three guys talking here. We could be three girls <laughs> having a different conversation. But you know how there's some like girls who have like, all these conditions. You're like, you, like here, here's my rider of all the things I need to be your girlfriend. There's other <laughs> girls who are just awesome. Like, you might end up marrying those girls. Um, a lot of the, the VCs, like, if you go to a lunch when the, you're the only entrepreneur and there's like four of them, right. and they get into this whole like, how, what kind of term were you able to squeeze on this guy? And it's like this power tripping thing. It's pretty. A, really? For the yeah. wrong, yeah. Bit of that. For the oh. wrong VCs, yeah. And then I think that some insane. of them have. What I found with the VCs, they have a philosophy, mm -hmm. and if they are very rigid about their philosophy because. All they have is their, their sort of signal detection, right? And their, sure. and their philosophy at the end of the day, they don't build anything. So they get this core philosophy. I think the good firms have this philosophy of find the, the best, best entrepreneurs, invest in them, believe in them, and give, give it all you got. And never doubt them. Like, just be tireless supporters. And then the, the mid-market ones, like you got, is it true that the lower tier ones or like not as big names were tougher on terms yeah, and more we argumentative? We've got all kinds of stupid terms from other people. What's an example of a stupid term? Uh, you know, I mean, some people will ask for big, big liquid liquidation preferences. What right? is a liquidation so, preference? Well, it's, it's for so the people you want to. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, so, you, so you you build a company, and let's say you know five million dollars go into the company. That's that's our case. Yeah. And then you know, if you if you're good terms, you sell the company for let's say you know thirty million. Yeah. The first five million go to the VC. Yeah. And the rest is split according to ownership stake, right? Right. Uh, but 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 some VCs will say, well, we, we want our money back double. Right, and then the rest is here, right? And that's right. a liquidation preference. Right. So if it's a thirty million dollar deal, they say, and they have twenty five percent of the company, they get ten million first. So and now they've gotten their original right? principal back. They yeah. doubled their money, <laughs> and then they're going to get twenty five percent of their range. Twenty five million, another five million. It, which makes it much safer for them, of course. Yes, um, there's no downside. If the company sells for fifteen million, they're going to wind up getting ten, yeah. and then of the remaining five, they're going to get twenty five percent. They get another buck twenty five. Ridiculous. Basically, yeah. Ridiculous. So, 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 so when so people say liquidation preference, you should say F you. <laughs> or you should just walk away in, because in, it's crazy. In, in early rounds, absolutely. In later rounds, I think there may be reasons why you might do it. Why is that? Cases. To have a higher valuation? Yeah, you know, there's, there's all kinds of, you know, uh, knobs to twist. I, I'm yeah. not an expert, by the way. You yeah, know, yeah. I've done one round. <laughs> right, right, right. So um, then you decide, I got to get out of Denmark. I got to get to the United States. So, uh, yeah. Uh, like many entrepreneurs in Europe do, they realize they're not going to build a world-class huge company no. in Europe. And and it, it's it's kind you, of sad. You it's agree with sad. that? It's kind of sad. Yeah, but uh, you know, and, and and it's it's also strange because you know, here is a company that you know is, who's which whose primary presence is online, right? A website, right? <laughs> There's no reason it can't be done in Europe. I, exactly right, and and you know, most of our business is going through credit card transactions at the time, um, and uh, they take credit cards in Europe. I understand. We we, we can do that there. Yes. You know, it's, it's not American a big Express problem. Visa, M more or less. Well, American generally Express will work. <laughs> American Express maybe not so much. Oh, well, <laughs> I don't think we thought of doing it, but uh, I yeah. think you can. Um, and uh, 
And you know, then we had like a sales guy in San Francisco to kind of you know talk to yeah. American customers and, and help with the larger deals, and, and that's kind of all good. And I was flying around all the time to meet people. Um, so why can't you do it in, in Denmark? Um, you know, first of all, you know, capital is, is more difficult there, as, right. as we experienced. Right. Um, I think it's getting better now, actually. But but it was lots pretty, of red tape. It was, um, you know, no, actually, that's not the case. Oh, I, what I, is it then? It's insane with the red tape in the U.S. compared to Denmark. Oh wow, it really is. So what is it? What um, is the, yeah, the so, problem in Denmark? So the problem is that um, that um, it's so far away. <laughs> like I mean, as we were go going from being a sort of software company to being still a software company, but sort of a player in the ecosystem. Right. We, we were having to deal with, uh, and ha having the opportunity to deal with like the chip companies, the OS companies, the f like the, you know, the phone, uh, co like phone manufacturing companies, yeah. the internet companies, etc. cetera. Um, and they're all either here yeah. or, you know, have a big office here. So being able to go to lunch. Exactly. The same, and it's, it's really strange. The, the same day as somebody calls you or the next day is people invaluable. Are sort of, people are sort of weirdly, I, it's not on purpose, but people are slightly xenophobic, ah. and and I, I've just noticed like you know if you if mm. you I, I can I can feel it myself like if 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 somebody calls you and it's like this you know zero one one and then like a long string not of a real digits, company, um, you know you just the, the the conversation is just slightly harder. They, they and, discount and, it. Uh, yeah, and there's a slight sort of amount of sort of distancing. That's fascinating. Um, and and uh, I, I know uh, actually uh, the, the the day I really realized it is that you know we work with a uh, tremendous uh, you know woman who does uh, some of our PR. And she lives in Hawaii, right? Uh, but she has the six fifty number, right? <laughs> so whenever I could talk to her, I always I, I sort of visualize it's her in she's Palo Alto, there. Right? right, right, sure. She's in the middle. I'm gonna get a six fifty number. Yeah, yeah let's it's, do that. Let's get six fifty number so everybody thinks we're there. It actually does make I a think, difference. I, I think a three ten is fine too, you know. Right. <laughs> but it's not like nine, whatever. Oh, I don't know what's yeah, Hawaii yeah. Oh, is, oh, you know? well, well. all right. When we get back, I want you to show sure. us the actual games. Let's get into the actual product. Sure, sure, uh, sure. And talk about that. And we got a bunch of questions from executive producer Jeff Clapp, who's doing a tremendous job. Cool. Um, and I'll tell you about somebody who's doing a tremendous job. Mailchimp, Mailchimp, Mailchimp. I love Mailchimp. What is Mailchimp? <laughs> that is a great question. Thank you, David, <laughs> for teeing it up. Um, you probably have a lot of emails now on your list. You probably have a lot of people. Five hundred thousand people have downloaded it. I'm guessing you have a certain number of their emails. A few hundred thousand. Uh, how do you communicate with those people? How, do you know what percentage of them and what their cloud scores are? Do you know nope. um, where they're located? Do you know how many open their emails? Do well, you, we know some of that. Some of that, right. What MailChimp does is it does all of it. They huh. are the most robust email platform ever created. It's software as a service. Sure. These are incredible guys. Uh, and it's free if you have 2,000 subscribers to send up to 12,000 emails per month. Uh, there's no contract, no trial. The free plan is always free. They're constantly adding uh, innovations like their uh, iPad app, their iPhone app. And they're great at transactional emails. You know what those are. Those are the simple emails that you send back and forth, like, hey, you can download here, and your oh, sure. password has changed. Uh, and the delivery rates are better than anybody else in the business. Go check oh. out MailChimp. Okay. Uh, and when you load <laughs> in, <you> will. <laughs> you, you, you need to have the software, because when you look into it, mm -hmm. I can go log in and see uh, who my users are, where they're located. I can have them take a survey and put them on different lists. So you could say, are you doing games? Are you doing art projects? You know, how many people are in your company? And you could have five mailing lists, one for people with companies over 500, one for people with companies between 100 and 500 employees, sure. and just start segmenting your list. You could say, for people in Asia, I'm going to send this email, and for people in the United States, I'll send this one, um, and then look at the open rates and all this kind of stuff. Sure. It really makes it uh, super easy, and of course, it's free. They have been a tremendous sponsor of the show. I think they're right up there with Trada uh, and GoToMeeting. Um, and Doc Co is like the just longest running sponsors at this point. They're awesome guys. And thank you to MailChimp for all they've done for this week in startups and keeping independent media like this free. And I mean this sincerely. Um, you cannot find shows like This Week in Startups anywhere else, right? I mean, this is a massive production. There are not for free. Not for free. There are 10 people working on the show every week. We're doing it twice a week. It may go to three times a week. If you were in the studio right now, you'd see $100,000 worth of equipment. And every week we want to put a new camera on. We want to put Tyler's computer on. It's just... The costs add up, and to do it sustainably at this quality level takes massive amounts of resources, and we could not do it without the fine people at MailChimp and Trada. Go ahead and thank them on your Twitter account. Thank you, at MailChimp. Thank you, at Trada. David, show me the magic. Show me a demo sure. here. Pull out your phone, and let's get the over-the-shoulder shot. Man, i got so many great technical people here. They make everything possible. Here it is. Uh, beautiful. It's perfectly framed. Uh, and uh, now this is... Um, this is an iPhone game. An uh, iPhone game. Tremendously. Chilingo. Are those the guys who do Angry Birds? 
Um, they t publish Angry Birds. They publish Angry it, Birds, right. They actually, it's, it's actually a part of uh, Electronic Arts now. Ah, got it. So this is just, you know, one, one beautiful game made with Unity. Wow. It's uh, this kind of, uh, you know, stick shooter. You walk around, you know, killing these gangster types. I like that. It's beautifully done, uh, really beautifully executed. That is gorgeous. Done by a really small team as well. Um, so they use your software? Yeah. So these guys, like a whole bunch of other people, uh, use you know Unity to build uh, web games, mm -hmm. uh, iOS games, Android games, and also uh, console games. So if they build this game in your software, mm -hmm. they can port it to all these platforms? Yes. And that's pretty easy to do? Extremely easy. Now, like, when they're in the software, I, I do they... A, I just read a tweet this morning that somebody had ported his web game to, uh, to iOS in five minutes. Wow. Yeah. So does that mean like it's as easy as hitting publish and it builds the actual iPhone app, or do they need to have some iPhone expertise to wrap it properly? You know, you'll need to figure out a few things to, yeah. to, to do, do it well. Um, um, actually, the, the iOS, uh, the, the, yeah, well, it's a, it, 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 I mean, it might take a couple of hours to set up the first time, uh -huh. but after that, it's, it's a really smooth wow. flow. So the idea now is, uh, in the video game industry, because of platforms like Unity, mm -hmm. people can build games how much faster? I mean, if you have the engine, sure. what is left to build? They you have know, to build the 3D models, they have to build the artwork. Mm -hmm. And then what? The game mechanics? Yeah, there's a whole, yeah, and, and 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 you know physics and lighting and, mm -hmm. and uh, you know audio integration and 3D sure. audio. There's just a whole bunch of infrastructure that you have to build. Right. And you know for for big companies for for big studios, Unity is just like really a nice like convenience. Right. And it saves them a lot of money. Um, but uh, but for small t small teams, it, it can be completely transformational. Like the difference between not doing and doing. Ah. Um, so how much of the game is the platform? I mean, if you were going to look at pre, you know these platforms being available, sure. if they were going to make that game, how much of it would have been building the platform, in your estimation? Um, so actually, kind of a small amount of it. Like the artwork is built elsewhere, right? You right. use you know, Photoshop for the images, yeah. and uh, yeah. you're using Max, Maya, yeah. Softimage, Blender, all these applications for the 3D, 3D modeling and the animation. Yeah. And then you kind of integrate all this into Unity, hmm. basically sort of dropping it in a folder, and, and yeah. then you sort of you know, whip up uh, you know, the world, place objects, Define properties, uh, mm. you know, set lighting, tune physics, and then you basically write uh, C sharp. Uh, no, JavaScript. what I'm saying is, without the platform, yeah. what's left? What, how much would it take? I mean, um, if they had to build a platform themselves, I mean, it would take ten times longer. Yeah, easily. easily. I mean, for for small projects, right? Yeah. For a really large project, you know, it's probably like more like ten percent, right? Right. But for small projects, it's it's yeah, it could be you know, I mean, you can make a game, a nice game, in like a couple of weeks. Wow. If you're a small team and you know, know you know what we, what you're doing. But, but building the, the, the technology underneath might take you know, half a year or more. This has been sort of a revolution, um, the platforms. Mm -hmm. And the platforms combined with smartphones, combined with app store monetization. Mm -hmm. I mean, these three things lining up have it's, changed everything. It's been you know, a good ride for us, right? Yeah. I mean, we, we, made, we made this bet that you know, small teams, right. and now well, we're actually moving uphill, but, but initially we made this bet that small and medium-sized teams uh, on open platforms would you know, have a big relevance. Right. We started with web and you know when iOS opened up we went there really quickly. Right. Uh, you know the, the, the sort of previous I, 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 you know incarnation of the game industry was much more focused on uh, console. Console and, and, or and, PC. And, and sort of high end gaming DVD, PC, you know. Call of Duty. I, exactly right. Yeah. So so and and, and um, yeah so we just made the bet that the opposite would happen. <laughs> And, ah, and, and that it, it would it, fragment smaller games, simpler games in a way. In some cases easier yeah. to play. Yeah. Uh, more accessible, I guess, would be the generous way to say it. Exactly, and and that's happened to a very high degree. And and now you know, uh, you know, we kind of have the energy to also push the quality of the platform uphill. Right. So now you know, it's basically you know, we're, there's a very small gap between our stuff and the million dollar engines. Wow. So your engine, uh, how much would that person pay to use it to make that game? Are they are they paying based on their sales? Are they paying a flat rate? It's a flat rate, just uh, wow. just like buying Photoshop or, or Flash. Wow. So yeah. a couple thousand dollars. Yeah. That's it. That's basically it. Wow. Uh, that's, that's all. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we have a few other models, like, you know, for console, it's actually per game, because that's the only thing that works there. Right. Um, so you make a dollar per game or two dollars per game or something like that? Um, no, it's actually just like a fixed fee, like ah. sort of, you know. Oh, per game. Yeah, per, like a ah. yeah, so per, per title. Per title, yes. Yes, yes. 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 Um, and, uh, uh, and we have a few other models. We license our source code, and we have some support programs and stuff like that. But, but like, really, most of the business is just these kind of seat-based licensing, like, like buying professional software. Uh, producer Rodrigo asks, um, do you have any plans to add augmented reality uh, to the system? Has anybody used the system yes, to sort of build for a whole bunch of that, actually. Yeah. What, what's your take on it? 
How, uh, how are they using it? Is that going to become a legitimate trend, or is it just something fancy buzzword? You know, I don't actually know yet. <laughs> I mean, there's been really cool kind of you know novelty experiences, right? right. Like Cheerios, there was a Cheerios game in the browser made with Unity. Uh -huh. um, Qualcomm has actually developed like a sort of a plug into Unity mm -hmm. for Android, uh, which allows you to very easily to make uh, AR games mm -hmm. for uh, for Android phones. Right. Um, but there hasn't been a Call of Duty or a, Nint or a, a Super Mario Brothers. I've yet you know. to see the sort of killer app, you know, the yeah. thing that, that, you know, beyond the, Yelp. the stuff that beyond excites you, but, yeah. but actually also becomes like a, you know, sustained uh, business right. model or a way of, you know, enjoying experiences. Yeah. Um, so I don't know. I mean, there's a whole bunch of innovation going on. And, and, and with something like Unity where you, you know, make it that easy, right. you know, that innovation can move faster. Um, exactly where it goes, I, you know, I'm not very good at predicting the future. Yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, you you only made one game on your own system. What did you learn from making that game uh, about game making? You know today. I and think how it's I, I think I forgot most of it. I think the one thing that I, I remember painfully was like learning curve. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, games you know are, are sort of learning systems in in a way, right? You you present this game to people and they have to kind of learn it as they play it, right? And that that's sort of a particular style of product design, which you know is is kind of refined as yeah. an art. <laughs> And, and we did it really badly, so the learning curve was like, there was this big, you know, kind of uphill in the beginning. Yeah. Once you learned it, it was actually a great game. <laughs> right. So, the, I mean, the, the one of the things that's going to happen is these mobile public, what do you think these mobile, the outlook is for these mobile publishers? You know, um, if there's so many people making games, mm -hmm. how many Angry Birds can there be? You know, there's going to be a lot. I mean, there's going to be a lot? You know, I, I, how, many, how many smartphones do we have in the world today? Like, you know, I don't even remember the number, but 500 million maybe? Yeah, I think it's about a half billion right now. Yeah, it's yeah, going to yeah. go to 3 billion. It's going to go to 4.5 billion, right? Correct. I mean, everyone will have one of these yeah. over 10 years. Yeah. And uh, so I think there's a lot of like, energy left in that market. Yeah. Um, where does it, when you made your bet that things were going to go where they are now, and that was... Four years we, ago, we, we, you didn't, started we that? didn't actually make that bet, right? No. We didn't know. But, well, but yeah, well, we had this. We had you this were originally wet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But you had a, a vision or an insight of where things were going to head, and now we're sure. there, right? Mm -hmm. Like three, four years later. Yeah. Where? How does that trend continue three, four years out? Does it get to a point where high school kids are making games in classes? Or uh, they are. <laughs> right. I mean, but no, where do you? Where does it? What's the end of that? It's like. a good question. I mean, uh, you know, sometimes we, we, we think of, you know, digital video and what uh, what that did to, you know, filmmaking sure, sure. Um, and, and, you know, home studios to yeah. music. Um, and, uh, and and actually, I think it's interesting. So ask any programmer are, in the are, world. Are, we at, are yeah. we at like a plateau right now where it's kind of going to stay at this level of college, you know, uh, you know, mo most people can get into this with a relatively not a lot of work, or is it going to get, is there going to be another layer of breakthrough where it's going to get so simple that I think high school another, kids are going to make Angry Birds? I think there'll be another breakthrough. Wow. Uh, it may not look like a big breakthrough, right. but a, an evolution, right? Right, but, right? But if you look away for a while and look back, it's right. probably going to look like a revolution, right? Okay. Is it, are console games going to win, or are smartphones going to destroy consoles? Uh, I think smartphones are absolutely going to destroy consoles. The concept I mean, of the consoles con are still there, and, and you right. know there's a huge install, uh, reasonably big, uh, like very focused install base. Right. Like everyone who has a console like has some interest in games, or at least had it at yeah. one point, right? Yeah. And 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 the, the, the console manufacturers are pretty smart, right? They're opening them up, they're yeah. turning them into, into media centers, and yeah, sure. you're watching Netflix on your Xbox, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Um, Downloadable content on Xbox. Uh, so they're doing a whole bunch of things very the right. The PlayStation Network is going to come back online, I hear next year. Eventually. <laughs> 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 no, it, it really breaks my heart. It's have, pretty amazing, isn't it? We have it? customers that are in trouble because of it. Like, really? you know, yeah, well, game it launches are being sad. delayed, and it, it's a mess. And and what is the what is the take? You were at E3 for the last three days. Yeah. What was the take at E3 mm -hmm. about Sony and the PlayStation? What do people think? Yeah, I don't about actually, the hack. I don't actually discuss it with any single person. Really? Yeah, it's just not. I don't know. I, I'm so just people actually don't care. Well, I, a whole bunch of people care, but I'm just looking. Further out. I mean, I, I, you yeah. know, this is. Kind it wasn't of like the topic of discussion. Not from the people I've talked to. Really no, interesting. Kind of I would think that that would be like such a huge topic, but I'm sure. Yeah. A number of hours was spent discussing it at the show floor, but yeah. I wasn't in that conversation. Not, uh, and what's E3 like these days? I mean, you were, you've I mean, been there for the last couple of days. Obviously, yeah. uh, from I mean, the looks always... of it, you were out very late last night. <laughs> How late did it go? Be honest. <laughs> well, uh, so sort of late. Late <laughs> as in like we went for pancakes and waffles. And the sun came up late, or late no. like I got home in time to. Watch Craig Kilborn. Game game XX like uh, like drinking. <laughs> Let's just put it like that. What kind of drinking games? <laughs> drinking games, really? No, just drinking in general. Oh, just drinking in general. Yeah. Um, um, but so what is E3 like? Because I went to the first E3 and E3 then it became this, this huge like PR like it every is, consumer. It, it kind of died for. A 
little while. They they yeah. kind of almost they kind of shut it down for a right. year or two, right? right? But it's this kind of loud, ugly, like you know, sort of you know, dazzlingly bright, yeah, uh, Vegas thing <laughs> with you know a lot of kind of booth talent, uh, you know, booth sc talent. scantily clad and all this stuff. I really, I re I really think find it a very ugly thing. Yeah. <laughs> but it's beautiful. You, kind of, you go there and, and you see all these upcoming games and like, you know, people are investing insane amounts of money making the games and like, you know, these showreels are like cost millions of dollars, right? Wow. It's, it's, it's crazy. Um, and that's really cool. And then you, you know, kind of, you know, worry about where the money is going to come from because the production costs are going up for these console games, right? Right. And, and you just know that most of these games will not succeed. <laughs> right. I mean, it's uh, becoming like the movie business, I mean, they're making, I don't know how much Call of Duty made, but I think it was like a billion dollars in the first It was like month. a billion, yeah, or yeah. something like that. It was unbelievable. It I mean, was. But they spent a hundred million, two hundred million building it, something insane. And, and that's a great story. I mean, yeah. the problem is most of the other games don't even do that. I mean, they don't even make a hundred, right? Yeah. In some sense, doesn't the big studios would prefer that your platform didn't exist at all? And they, it, I don't think Unity has so much to do with it. I mean, it's the, it's the new, you know, it's the new devices uh, right. and uh, ways of selling it. And, you know, Maybe, do you, do you, uh, maybe do you, unfortunately. Do you get in any conversation? Do you hear any kind of uh, blowback of like, you know, yeah, God damn these angry yeah, birds? Yeah, exactly, yes. Yeah. I mean, there's a certain frustration with uh, like, you know, the, and the fact that, you know, the price points on, on iOS, the App Store, a dollar. Are, are a dollar, like $2. $2. Yeah. Like, if it's a really fancy game, then it's like $5, right? Yeah. And people are saying, like, you know, you can't make money on that, which I, by the way, th think is absolute, uh, you know, bull. Yeah. Uh, because well, there you go. <laughs> Very good. Well done. Welcome to the jar. Welcome to the jar. It's ten bucks. <laughs> Thank you for Here we go. Thank you for coming on the show. Sorry. How much do I owe? There you go. Ten Sorry. bucks in the jar. Um, That's okay. Don't uh, worry. It's going to go towards a keg at the. Uh, I think we're getting close to keg money here. I think it's, keg is about a hundo. And, and it is that ba stupid thing because. Um, there are so many devices, and, 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 and these are, you know, gaming devices. People are like, you know, it's the, it's the number one use case for the iPad. Right. And I guess it's the number two use case for the iPhone after, like, wow. talking on the phone and maybe no, listening no, to music. Phone is pretty far down on the list in terms of use of the phone. Yeah, it must be, like, the surfing the web, yeah. playing games. I think, yeah, playing games yeah, I mean, is, like, seems to me I've number one on the iPad by a real margin. I mean, this is totally anecdotal, but I don't have, you know, having had a kid, I have no time for console games. I used to play some console games. I used to play some PC games. I, I have like four or five games I've bought over the last year on my iPad that mm -hmm. I like to play when I'm, you know, go, before I go to bed for 20 minutes, I'll play a game or sure. online at Starbucks or, uh, you know, you see me at the airport, I'll be playing, you know, Plants vs. Zombies or something while I'm, uh, you know, no, turning the time. like the stewardess trying to get you to turn the thing off, sir. I know, and I'm like, I got one more left. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sir, we have to take the plane it off, It is sir. incredible, though, we, like when you go from the back of the plane yeah. to the front and you see 10 people playing Angry Birds. I mean, this is a revolution. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's amazing, and, and, and people are playing these games, and it may be different games, and you know, maybe, maybe you have to kind of design the experience differently, but these are games made by you know, game developers. Um, tell me about Risk as an entrepreneur. It's actually, that's interesting. Wait, you're like, staying on there. The, vi the virality of Angry Birds mm -hmm. right. is, to a certain extent, based on the fact that other people can see you in the plane yeah. playing it around. Oh, the mobile, oh, that's interesting. Oh, so, no, definitely. And people are talking uh, about it. Why and, and platform then it, games are at a Yeah, advantage. well, because you're not walking around. Exactly. You're not on with Southwest with, you with your Xbox playing yes. Call of Duty. Right. No. So in a way, there's built-in marketing to the iPhone games because somebody can lean over your shoulder and say, what game is that? And yeah. because the potential audience for these, for, for these high-end games is smaller, it's right. also like a more sparse network. So I think, you know... Right, the chances of... It would be like one person per... I mean, virality, I, th I, th I think, yeah. is just like a weaker... Much weaker. Uh, in that, like in that two space, people yeah. on the plane playing yeah. Call of Duty and 25 playing Angry Birds. I guess. I'm not yeah. an expert in virality. Talk about risk as an entrepreneur. Sure. I mean, you, you, you guys seem to have focused on this project for many years before mm -hmm. actually having any success. Sure. Um, how important is, is this sort of persistence and risk-taking to no, your success, to I the success of an entrepreneur? Sure. I never understand this risk-taking concept. Like, yeah. There was no risk-taking for us. Like, we were doing awesome stuff, right. learning a lot. Yeah. And, oh, well, you know, maybe this is special for Denmark. We lived in a society where if we got sick, we could just go to the hospital. Yes. <laughs> so that actually helped. Right. We didn't actually go to the hospital, the hospital right. but knowing that, right? Um, we had to pay your rent, too, I mean, somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you were living in a basement. And, of course, we, you know, we were not exactly, like, you know, building our, you know, our, our sort of, you know, personal value during these years. Right. Except, well, it turned out we did. But, but uh, like, you know, we're not putting money in the bank. Well, that's exactly what you were doing. You it, were building it, your personal value, it, it not was. your personal net worth. <laughs> and there is a distinction. Yes, uh, that, that's actually true. Right. So, so You for, were investing in you. Yes. 
Uh, that's actually true because right. we learned. Well, you learn so, so much. So there is no, this. there is no risk. I, for, I don't know. I never saw that. Um, and then you know, you launch this product, and you're doing everything to avoid risk, right? Right. I mean, you made, we made this kind of, you know, so, sort of bold move going freemium, but that was after we raised the money from Sequoia, so right. we knew that if somehow our revenue would go, you know, right, would would, would go. You were haywire. conservative when you needed to be. We've always been very conservative. You know, right. we, we sit on a lot of cash. Yeah. We're profitable. Um, you know, basically almost every month. So there's a time to be risk averse, and there's a time to be take risk. The thing is, I never understand this taking risk thing because <laughs> you don't actually think it exists. I think see, I think there's certain guys because I have the same thing that you have, sure. and I know other entrepreneurs. I think there's like a gene or some defect yeah. or in certain humans uh -huh. where they don't take risk. Yeah. But then in our society today, you don't actually die. You know, like you used to, if you took risk, you would just die. Sure. So they take you out of the gene pool. Uh -huh. Now it's like, I mean, if you take risk, the chances of you dying are low. And even if you're like stupid enough to be riding a motorcycle around Los Angeles and you get hit, you know, there's enough ambulances that you, you may have a chance of surviving. Sure. There's, but, there's definitely, uh, yeah. though, a common <laughs> thread. Uh, there's a certain subsection of entrepreneurs who don't feel the risk at all. Right. Yeah. It's just they haven't, it's not an option. Yeah. You know, it was that, there was no other choices. So it was, but, but, it, but it's more nuanced than that because it's not like you just want to, you, you're so. Uh, fearless that you just want to go spend all the money. It's not like you're living with three months in the bank. Mm -hmm. There are people who I've met who are insane and will push it to the envelope. Sure. It's, and then it goes beyond risk taking. It goes to just like this audacious. Really? Um, you met entrepreneurs that, like that? Oh, like, yeah, I've got a couple of good friends <laughs> yeah. who are so audacious that they will have 90 days of capital in the bank. I mean, we often had like two weeks of capital in the early days, right. but that was not well, what on if purpose. You, but, what if, yeah, <laughs> but what if you had 20 million in the bank and you said, I'm just going to go at $5 all. million a month in terms of burn rate. So sure. there, there's, a, there's a certain recklessness. There's, there's yeah. a recklessness, but most entrepreneurs who are successful, I mean, have this balance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not scared of starting, mm -hmm. but they are scared of failing. Mm -hmm. do, do you have a fear of failure? Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I have a big responsibility. Be honest here, yeah. No, yeah, I mean, I have a big responsibility for, like, my people and my customers. Right, right. Um, so failing would impact them. It would be horrible for a lot of people, right? right? So that scares you? Um, not really, because we're so careful. Like we're always right. sitting on so much cash, and we're right. just like really like careful. So you're people. cautious, but not scared. Uh, yeah, no, I'm not really scared. What I'm actually scared of only is 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 that um, I'm not really even scared of competitors and stuff like that. What I'm really scared of is the shif a shift in the tech ecosystem, uh. making us uh, irrelevant. Mm. Um, so, but that is something that's out of your control. So what scares you? Is the thing you have. It's no the one thing I can't control. Wow. So what, of course, what I do to control it is like watch things like a hawk. Right. <laughs> Talk to a lot of people trying to figure out what's kind of around the around the corner, mm. um, and then be making plans for it. And this is why they say only the paranoid survive, isn't yes. it? Yes, and uh, that's very true. You and have to be paranoid. You're about a damn paranoid. Yeah. So you are paranoid. Oh yeah, very much so. Not scared. Not scared. Paranoid. paranoid. <laughs> so and constantly worried. Because you're paranoid doesn't mean they're not after you. <laughs> <laughs> they are. No, they are. I mean, well, that's the tech ecosystem. So that's, that's like, that actually sort of is you know. Good. I mean, I what do you, what, tell path. me about the things where you've been paranoid in the past. Sure. And it's paid off. Well, you know, it's 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 not uh, done, but but uh, you know, we uh, uh, flash. Um, you know, fl flash uh, is sort of you know the default thing to use for for mm. games on the web, right? Yes. And uh, and and you know Unity is like incredibly much better sure. for 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 three D games and and just a lot of different ty types of of, of of you know experiences. Um, also easier to use actually for a lot of people. Um, and three D is kind of a very kind of nice. It's a, it's a very efficient way to to produce um, certain experiences. So so, uh, but because Flash is such a default, you know a lot of people will go with that anyway. Yeah. Um, and Flash is doing 3D now. They've got some 3D so, engines so that are pretty good. So, so they actually announced 3D like many, many, many for many years. They kept saying, "Oh, it's coming," um, and then finally they actually showed it off early. Uh, 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 sorry, late last year, uh -huh. um, and it's in beta now, and it's launching in the autumn. Everyone expects there's there's not an official date on what it. What do they call that? What's the name of it? It's called Molehill. Molehill. Um, That's like Molehill is the. Um, Molehill is the code name for the project, yes, not the yeah. actual product. Though. No, no, no. It, it's just going to be a part of Flash. Mm. Um, and uh, so you are paranoid about that, like, hey, this is a player. So, so, so that, that was the thing we were yeah. looking at, like, kind of, kind of worried, you know, yeah. because we knew that although we were kind of better in many, many ways, people would still, yeah. you know, default to that in, in many cases. Right. Um, so what we did, we, you know, we looked at it in our parano with our paranoid eyes, and uh, and we saw that we could actually. Um, get to a point where we could allow people to create content inside Unity and then export it to Flash. Ah, so here it is. I pull it up on my screen. Hey guys, sure. take a look. Um, here is a, 
um, a zombie game in Flash. Obviously, I'm pulling this up on YouTube, but it looks really good. So what you said was, hey, let's, um, we're paranoid about this. Mm -hmm. So instead of worrying about the delivery mechanism, let's focus on the tool and let's let people export to that delivery mechanism. And our business is the tool primarily, although we maintain right. this very great engine. Right. Um, but, but we sell the tool right. uh, and not so much the engine. Ah, so basically you took that paranoia and you created a strategy from it. Yes. And that's a healthy use of paranoia. Absolutely. And, and like, I mean, Channeling it. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, I, you know I, I'm just the CEO, right? So I couldn't actually make this happen, right? But we put two of our very best engineers on it, and they you know, fa as, fi fa figured a path, right? As CEO mm -hmm. with highly skilled technical people, mm -hmm. it is a challenge sometimes to get them to do what you want, to um, lead them. I don't even try. You don't try. You no, not really. I mean, they're, so smarter, how do you they're get smarter than me, right? right. So, so how so. do you get people who are smarter than you, admittedly? Mm -hmm. And I have this experience uh, as course. well. You know, you, if you hire 100 think, people or 50 people, some of them are going to be smarter than you, and certainly all of them should be smarter than you in the areas that you, you've hired them to work. You try, right? Right? I yeah. mean, that would be the ideal situation. Mm -hmm, that would mm -hmm. be success. How do you get people who are smarter than you then to take this threat seriously, yeah. as opposed to them saying, you know, like, screw Flash, Flash is garbage. Like, I mean, I'm sure, sure some smart people on your team said Flash is not a threat, mm -hmm. and they were not paranoid about it. Sure. How do you get your paranoia out of your head and sure. into their actions? Actually, to be honest, it was they were more paranoid than I was. Oh. And they actually did this exploration kind of by themselves. Ah. And we give them freedom to, 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 to like, experiment. Mm -hmm. we, have a, we, we call it Fridays are for fun. So ah, on Fridays, twenty percent time. Basically, twenty percent time, and uh, so people on Fridays are supposed to like do stuff that's outside of the normal roadmap, mm. and uh, there's a whole bunch of experimentation going on. We actually also do quarterly boot camps where, like, for a week we have this kind of same concept. Oh, really? So we spend a lot of energy like letting people kind of roam freely. Ah, interesting. And uh, and like, you, you, what do you do the boot camp? Do you actually leave? The office, or do you do it at the office? Uh, we do it uh, at the Copenhagen office. At the Copenhagen. We have engineers in a lot of different locations, ah. and we, they, they all come together there and, ah. and code. So every quarter you got to fly 10 people from the valley there or something? Oh, it's a lot of people. We're very distributed, by the way. Right. We have five offices. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and why is that? Why do you have five offices? Oh, to support people because you just want to get talent outside the valley? It's talent. I mean, we actually don't have any engineers. Oh, well, we have a couple of engineers in, in Silicon Valley. Right. But uh, so all the engineering is basically in Europe. Right. So and that's what Europe's good for, isn't it? Um, there are some pretty good people there. I mean, are they really as are they as competitive as the people in the United States in your mind? Um, in, in, pa in Palo Alto, in the Valley specifically, uh, engineering wise. Yeah. Well, I mean, and I, they compete. I can't really say because we only hire these kind of game engine ah. like heavyweights, right. and it's a really rare skill set. Ah. And like, there's no place in the world where there's a lot of them at the same place. Ah, you so, have to basically so hire have them to work at home. Um, well, we have a few different places. We have Copenhagen. We have two different office, uh, offices in uh, in uh, in Lithuania. Oh wow! Uh, we have a facility in uh, in uh, Brighton, mm. in the UK, and uh, we're opening up an office in Stockholm. Ah. Uh, and probably at least one more. So basically, you are and creating telecommunicate telecommuting centers in a way. Yeah. So that you can get access to these people, to as opposed to trying to find them in the valley. Yeah. It's not worth trying to find them in the same location. It's too competitive anyway, right? Yeah, just it's difficult to find enough good people, and and we try to keep uh, all, all of the development or as much as, uh, as possible in uh, in the same time zones. So across the three different European time zones, we have we have people working together. Um, let's talk about the other competitors. Unreal Engine. Sure. Great engine. Great uh, engine. That's the one that's like the sort of big, eight hundred pound gorilla. Would you say, or is that? They are basically the default for a lot of the sort of uh, you know console games. Right. Um, and they came from the game Unreal. Those were the, what's the background of that company? weren't they like the Ep epic, epic epic games, games. or e epic mega games as they were called in the early days? Yeah. You know I don't even quite know the story, but yeah. the, I mean they were a AAA developer, right? Yeah. They did some games. The and big then, titles. And, and, and then, then they made the over engine. the years they started licensing the engine. That's how I know the story at least. Um, and uh, you know it's a tremendous company. You know great engine, um, focused on very different things than we focus on, uh -huh. uh, at least historically. So, you know, focused on like, you know, bringing like really big teams together and making them, you know, make AAA console games uh, and, and PC games. We focused on like smaller teams, uh, you know, more agile development um, and, uh, and, and for web and mobile. Uh, and well, what's happening now is of course that, you know, we started realizing that we can actually do the high-end stuff and we yeah. kind of have to, to serve our customers. So we're going really high end this year, just pushing a lot of technology. We've been recruiting like crazy engineers. Yeah, you've got over 100 people now. 125. 
125. 123, but I never know quite. So you added 100 of those in the last year? No, we, we basically uh, doubled. We pretty much doubled every year for the last you know few years. So that means there are people at the company that you really don't know that well. Oh, there's people I haven't met yet. Right. How, how do you, when you're entering the second phase, let's say mm -hmm. the first phase is, it's really, you have two phases. First is just a couple guys in the garage. That's phase zero. Then you have sure. phase one, which is like under 30 or 40 people where you can maintain a personal relationship as a CEO founder with them. Sure. Now you're in phase two, let's call it. Sure. Where you're starting I, I count to count like four or five, but <laughs> yeah, I'm trying know. to break it down to sort of <laughs> no, my right. experience. But you're, you're right, in my right. experience, it's of like course. there's the there's the core team that's yeah. ground zero. Sure. Then you have the first phase, which is under thirty, trying to find a market, and then you find a market and you go up from thirty to two hundred, let's say, uh -huh. or three hundred. Uh -huh. Sure. Um, how has that been an adjustment for you? Um, how have you had to change your style as CEO? Um, it's been difficult. Like I mean, and, and of course, you know, my job uh, would change every half year or so, right. very significantly. Um, I think the, w the most difficult part was actually going like from sort of 50 to 70. Uh -huh. At the same time, uh, I had moved to S Silicon Valley, and we're, we're t like, we had a couple of people in San Francisco already, but you know, we built it up to like we're 20 odd now. Um, and uh, so I moved away from my co-founders. Uh -huh. So communication lapsed, and right. it was just really difficult. <laughs> Do you honestly. find you have more, um, less, um, you, you're you're less simpatico. You're you're less in sync. You you agree less that because of the distance. That happened. Um, so so we basically had to step up our game and like sort of learn to communicate better. Yeah. So we created some very simple processes, just like weekly calls and like some wikis and some docs that we maintained, and and actually totally got it back together. So the devices actually helped you. You created devices systems to actually. Get sure. in sync as a team. Yeah. Well, actually, a lot of it just just like regularly scheduled calls. Right. So it's, it's not even very fancy stuff. Which developers are not going to set up themselves. You have to be show that leadership. Yeah, generally. but but I, I know this this is with the management team uh, mm -hmm. and, and and the sort of you know people who lead different things. Right. Uh, then the, the 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 engineering team. You know, my two co-founders are in Denmark. Right. And and basically lead that along with a few other lead developers. Tell so me. I don't have to be very involved in that, and they make basically all the product decisions. Tell me about connected TVs, internet TVs. We bought a couple here. Sure. You turn the TV on, mm -hmm. and it asks you to plug in your Ethernet and your Wi-Fi, yep. and all of a sudden there's a bunch of services already there, YouTube, Netflix, et cetera. Mm -hmm. How is that going to impact your business? We don't know is yet. Is it? <laughs> I, I mean, is that one of the paranoid things? Uh, no, it's, well, I, I, well... Or the opportunity? We, we just saw an opportunity, right? Yeah. So so I think, you know, what, what, the, what the TV guys woke up to one day was that they, they were sitting on, the, sitting on this, like, really bad business. Like, you know, these really expensive panels... Right. The margins are like you know, sort of three to seven percent. It sucks. It really sucks, right? And you have to move them around. It's and it's it's, them. it's a horrible business. For what, what they then realized is like you know they could actually capture the last ten feet and become content businesses, right? So they're turning themselves into that. Hmm. Um, you know, brilliant move. Samsung. Samsung. LG. LG. Sony. Sony. Uh, you know, Vizio. And interestingly, Sony oh. saw this fifteen years ago when they started buying music companies and movie studios. There you go. <laughs> I wasn't around to looking at that, yeah, but no, you're right. You were so, 10. <laughs> so, uh, what so are you 25 years old? 30? Uh, I'm 33. You're 33. Okay, yeah. so you're a little bit. You're an older, uh, elder statesman. You weren't that young in <laughs> no, 2005. No, no, I, I was just uh, not, in, uh, 1995. I was just not very business savvy. 1995. <laughs> how old were you in 1995? That was 15 years ago. You were 15. Uh, 18. You were 18. Yeah. 18. So you were in high school when the internet happened. Um, College. Yeah. Yeah. High school yeah. when the internet sort of hit in 94, 95. Yeah, yeah, that's true. Wow, yeah. So you I, actually I, I, remember I, the time before the internet. I you think remember dial-up bulletin boards. I wrote love letters in hand. Wow. I, I was the last guy to do that. You're I think. the last guy, right? You're no, like I mean, the like, last of Gen Y. <laughs> I mean, now it's sort of a now it's sort of a you know a, a novelty, right? But but no, I, you know, there's a whole shoebox somewhere. <laughs> Really? Uh, yeah, wow. Well, anyway, um, but, <laughs> but anyway, connected tell me, TVs. Tell me about connected. So, so, so I think I'm going to pop my collar. By the way, <laughs> I just, I've been sitting here because you know I have OCD, and I'm sitting here OCDing about the collar popping. I feel like I need to try the style for a little while. Maybe for the rest of the video, I'm going to pop my. I also feel like we got a similar thing going with the. Ha I mean, I have a little bit less, but I have a similar thing going with the hair here. I used to have that flock of seagulls like down to here. I used to shave that part. Wow, really? Yeah, I used to shave this whole part here, the all the way around, and then I, in the eighties, it was pretty good to me. I'll, I'll bring a photo. No, and you will laugh. Yeah. You're a good 80s guy. You got a little bit that. of a James Spader thing going. I used to get James Spader before I gained the pounds. But anyway, keep going. So, so connected TVs, connected right? TVs. So, so, so these guys wake up to the opportunity, Do you right? ever get James Spader? I don't know who this is. I'm not, I'm not a native really? here, you know. <laughs> keep talking. I'm going to pull okay, up James Spader sure. with you. So, so these guys wake up to this incredible opportunity they have. Uh, so they're all, all kind of scrambling to do it. And uh, 
you know, games are regarded as a sort of a, you know, yeah. a key uh, feature of any platform. So of course they want games, and hardware is catching up. So like a lot of these TVs basically are like, sort of like you know, smartphone power, yeah. and and by next year they'll be more like computers, right? Um, it's a very rapid cycle, by the way. So what kind of chips are they putting into them now? Um, you know, it's all over the map, but it's you know, ARMs, ARM processors, yeah. like pretty fast ones. There's Intel processors. What is the well. ARM processor? I mean, you hear that a lot. What is it? What does it mean? Oh, it's just a low power CPU kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, like know, mobile phone. Yeah, it's, or it's laptop, very. They're very like successful in mobile phones, I yeah. guess, because of like power, power. Um, uh, power, power. Yeah. Um, you balance, think Apple's right? going to make one of these TVs? You think they're going to make a physical? There's been a rumor out. I heard inside information they were making one four years ago. You think they're actually going to make one? No idea. Well, um, what do you think? What you got to tell you? Um, think about it for a second. I, I kind of want them to. <laughs> you would. I like You'd products. buy it. Um, well, I don't have a TV, so I'm not really sure. Um, really? Well, I have a computer. <laughs> oh, so you watch your TV on computer? <laughs> well, I don't watch much TV, but, but you when know, you watch a movie, yeah, it's uh, just on my laptop, basically, yeah. or, or iPad. So you're part of that, like. Yeah, I never had trend. a TV, and I probably never will. All right, so now um, so, the, the chips are getting better. <laughs> they have Wi-Fi yeah, now um, instead of just Ethernet ports, and yeah. that seems to be a fifty so, percent difference in connect connection rate. Oh yeah, so no, between I, I, Wi-Fi and Ethernet. Uh, Isn't that an interesting yeah. statistic? When they had Ethernet in them, yeah. like ten percent of people mm -hmm. set them up. When they put Wi-Fi in, seventy percent set them up. I heard, I heard that number as well. Yeah. Isn't that incredible? That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, it's just yeah, people don't have these cables. Well, who the hell? Really I mean, don't. it's hard enough to set up your TV and run the goddamn. Direct TV cable. I mean, I got to cut a hole in your wall and run an Ethernet cable. I mean, <laughs> exactly. It's it was a big deal. So, so anyway, so so these you know, and these these platforms are getting games. Right. And uh, our problem has actually been that we're uh, doing, running this tools business where we like you know have a special version for iPhone, yeah. Special version for Android, um, and and really there is not a lot, not enough developers asking us for a let's say you know a Samsung TV export option, right? Right. So so for us going and, and making that feature. Um, it's sort of it's kind of a risky thing for us because why doesn't Samsung pay you to do it? Um, well, there's all kinds of models you could work with, but you know I, I don't really don't believe much in sort of direct payments. You really have to build a kind of a sustainable business right. model around it. Um, well, wait a second, but isn't Windows getting paying developers to pay, build, giving them advances against their platform? I mean, yeah, this but is that's a good totally not, it's totally not sustainable, right? But it's good to get the first hundred developers. Oh, you, you have to, yeah, you can you yeah. can kick some you can kick start, start some Kickstart, things. Yeah. Um, and actually, like, and everyone is doing this. Um, the problem is that they're calling like the big publishers that have a lot of games. Ah. Our community has like as many games as any of the big publishers, right. but individually, like they have one or two games like per team typically. Right. Um, so they're not getting these phone calls. So ah. that kind of broke our, our, our heart. Um, so and, and we saw this opportunity, but also like we couldn't quite figure out how to build a, build a tools business. Right. So we launched something li late last year called Union, which is basically aggregating a whole bunch of games ah. from our community. They're all based on Unity, so right. we can basically port the underlying engine uh -huh. and recompile them. Mm -hmm. um, so we're striking deals now where we help these games get to new platforms. Ah, so you that can become a, a meta publisher. Yeah, sort of a distributor, aggregator. Like it's it's kind of our own model. Like I'm not sure anyone did. It quite doesn't the really same exist, thing. but you could basically it'd be like Apple saying we're going to bring the top ten thousand games mm -hmm. to the Samsung platform. Pay so, us. We'll take a little bit off the top and give it to the rest of you. Are you going to sure. take a little piece of the action? We're, we're, we're taking we're taking uh, twenty percent of the developers' payout. Oh, but the idea is it's it's that's a nothing. It's, that's a third less than uh, Apple. They should be happy. <laughs> sure, and 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 and, uh, and it's sort of the idea is it's purely incremental revenue, right? right? Because if you're putting your game yeah. uh, on open platforms, yeah. you can do that, mm -hmm. and you can give it to us, and we'll help try to monetize it. We don't guarantee anything except right. you know we're not going to do anything bad with it. Yeah, sure. Uh, and 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 if we can figure out ways to monetize it, which we can, uh, we'll send them you know most of their money back. Uh, you've been incredibly honest, and you've given us a lot to think about in terms of the video, the future of video games and gaming. Sure. Uh, we appreciate that. Let's pull up my David Spade, uh, Spader picture here for a second. Let's just see if we can get a com combination going here. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, wait a second. Look at that. Okay, wait, which camera is his camera? Look at this camera right here for a second. Okay, now pull up my camera, and let's do a three-way shot. Let's see if we can do this with the... Oh, come on, guys. I, I bought you a $40,000 TriCaster 850, and I can't pull up three shots? <laughs> That's not true. How, wait a second. I'm gonna, I'm calling BS. <laughs> ah, see, I saved myself ten bucks. I'm calling BS. You cannot pull up my. You can pull up his screen and my screen at the same time, and you can't pull up my computer at the same time. Not in four seconds. Not in four seconds. Okay. Well, we've been talking about it for forty-five. So I'm hoping that you can pull up all three at once, and we can. I mean, don't we know how to use this device yet? We should be able to put up like all five screens at once. Show me all five cameras at once. Can't do it. <laughs> So basically, this is just like having the three three-way TriCaster. We haven't really even learned all the incredible features of the TriCaster yet.
I mean, we're in HD, so that counts for something. But guys, next week, can we have? Can we pull up more than two screens at once? <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't mean to be a, a nudge about it, but we've had this technology for seven days. Shouldn't we know everything about it by now? <laughs> Welcome to working for Jason Calacanis. <laughs> I've been in terror since I got the TriCaster 850. I'm like, we have to know every feature of this immediately. I want to pull up Tyler's screen. I want to have eight screens. Um, hey, thank you to uh, at Trotta and thank you to at MailChimp um, for being amazing sponsors of the show. Uh, oh, we have a Shark Tank. Well, I don't have a modern here, so I wouldn't know. We have a Shark Tank. Okay. Well, we'll do a Shark Tank. Sorry, I'm editing the show, but we have one Shark Tank. Let's do the Shark Tank real quick. You know what the Shark Tank is? No. Okay, good. You're going to learn. Here we go. Awesome. This is it. It's a Shark Tank. We stole the idea from the people on television who do Shark Tank. It's a very popular show, um, <laughs> I think, on, like, uh, TBS or something. Um, so uh, who's on the call? Who do we have? Greg. Oh, can you hear me? Hey, hey, Greg, hey there you are. How are you doing? How are you? Good. Uh, Greg, I see that you are in, uh, um, which penitentiary are you in? <laughs> this, is our, this is our first prison, That's our right. first prison-based uh, Shark Tank. Okay, you know the rules for Shark Tank, correct? I do. I, well, I'm an executive producer. I, I, oh, you're an EP. Look at that, you yeah, got to the front of, of the line. One of the executive <laughs> producer privileges is if you would like to... Um, Go on Shark Tank or ask Jason. If it's quality, you get to jump the line because it's a line of 100 people. Steve, wheelchair at Disneyland effect in action. No, it's, it's not an inside. It's a no, re-inside. That's a re-inside. It's yeah. a re-inside. Okay, so you okay. know the rules. You have uh, 60 seconds. You got it. Uh, three, two, go. Okay. Hey, did you know your city just sold a used police car for $200, yet it was worth $5,000? That's a big problem, and it's happening in over 80,000 government agencies across the country. Can you believe in the times of uh, budget cuts and reductions in state and federal aid, most of these agencies are still pro practically giving their no longer needed items away for pennies on the dollar, especially when there are people willing to pay more for these items. As a former town councilman, I saw uh, this outrageous problem firsthand, and as an entrepreneur, I needed to fix this. So I put together Municipid, a compliant online auction and marketing platform that's free for government to easily sell their surplus and forfeitures to the public in an open, competitive, and convenient manner. I convinced local municipalities to try it, and it worked. They instantly saw the significant results on higher bids, and I pounded the pavement, knocked down doors. Today we're serving 500 government agencies like Philadelphia, Boston, to small towns and everything in between. And uh, the agency keeps 100%. We charge the winning bidder 5%. Okay, great. Uh, the business name is Munici Bid. As a municipal bid, is that right? Yeah. Yep. That's exactly I'm pulling right. up the web. Oh, I'm pulling up on the wrong computer. Let me pull it up over here. Uh, M U N I C I B I D dot com. Um, you saw a problem. The problem was people are um, municipalities don't have the technology to do auctions. I mean, part of the reason they're auctioning stuff off is because they're so short on cash. Uh, so they don't know how to do this right. They're leaving ten dollars on the table for every dollar they get. And I'm looking here at the stuff that you're. Um, 500 bucks for a Chevy Tahoe from 1999, Crown Victoria for 200 bucks. I mean, these things have to be worth more for just the parts. Um, well, wow. yeah, the, what, the, the, the issue is that they're literally just selling these for that price to, you know, if they're lucky, they'll get two or three people using the old uh, process. Using Municipid, we take it out online. We, we market the items for them to a national audience of bidders, uh, much larger, obviously, than what they would get locally. And these bidders compete against each other, and it drives that, that $200 car. When that's done, it'll be up to around four, four or $5,000. So that's, you know, again, $4,000 they didn't have before. And uh, we make it very easy for them. Um, you know, they, they use us, um, and uh, we, we end up selling their, their items far more than what they would ever get in their, uh, their um, previous process. At this point, I think I'm buying the 1993 Pierce 10-man Lance Squirt um, uh, fire truck. I mean, really, a fire truck for 10 grand? It, well, it's well, yeah, it's amazing actually. With fire trucks, the market for those are pretty soft um, because they can't be used uh, in the uh, the states and a lot of times in the, in, across the country because of environmental concerns with the emissions and things like that. So what happens is these guys buy them and export them overseas onto uh -huh. uh, you know to other departments or we have a bunch of uh guys that resell them to movie production companies to blow up or you know use in movies yeah i was about to say these would be great props uh, okay yep. 
Um, we could sell them to a preschool and let them have it as like a thing to play on and just decommission it. I think the idea is very strong. Um, I'm going to give the idea like, a, like an eight. Um, and I think the pitch was very tight. I think it's like... Um, now, with the pitch, I didn't hear anything that is very unique like or innovative necessarily. I do like the innovation in that they don't have to pay anything. But I almost feel like there's a step to go further, which is to have people come and take the pictures and stuff like that and a software as a service or an upsell into actually doing the auction for them. Yeah, we're actually moving into that. Oh, okay. uh, we're sort of stepping into that. So in, um, always so, in a pitch, but, always in a pitch you want to give a little bit of the and one more thing, just like Steve Jobs does. Always give us the one more thing. So you should have stopped your pitch at about 45 seconds and say, and after we get a foothold with this free auction platform, we're going to provide auction services where we take pictures of it and we actually uh, conduct the auctions for people because that's where the real money is and we can take 35% there. I was about to say, it seems like the, the lethargy of municipalities you could really <laughs> take it more advantage of. Yeah, I think, you, I think what you do here is you hire people in a couple of states to go manage the auctioning office stuff and they go audit what could be auctionable and they go into the actual um, municipalities and look at their inventory and suggest things to auction uh, mm -hmm. and then you take half of the money from the auction. Half There's there actually is a, uh, a company out there that's doing that, but a lot of <laughs> a lot of the municipalities find that it's so easy they're going they're doing it themselves and they're right. moving to us to do that. So great, uh, it's an interesting concept. But the yeah. biggest thing is the compliancy that we provide uh, for the uh, government agency, um, which is you know why they can't use some other providers. What did, Tyler? What are your scores? I would I. <clears throat> I mean the pitch was great. I, yeah, the pitch is great. Um, Solid. Yes, it's a solid eight pitch, and ideal-wise, I'm actually quite um, intrigued by it, like taking a model and applying it to a vertical that most people would not uh, consider, and there's certainly a lot of activity to be done there. My thought is, like, I, I feel like potentially you're leaving some money on the table with the how to do that, but you would know better, but um, nonetheless, I, I think it's very cool. There's a there's a there's definitely a good karma aspect to it, it seems, as well, like how, you know. Hopefully the cities are getting. And so, what did you think you, of the? You got the pitch at eight. The idea. Idea. Eight. Yeah, it's like it's a beginning of a great idea. Uh -huh. uh, David, go ahead and uh, score this. Uh, what do you score it on a pitch on a scale of one to ten? <laughs> ten being a perfect pitch when you pitched Ruloff on uh, <laughs> Ruloff Borta when you pitched him on. It. Obviously, Unity got a perfect ten because you got a check. But what would you rate the pitch on a, a, a six or a seven? Would be an average pitch. An eight or nine would be a good pitch. Ten would be per pitch perfect. Yeah, well, you know, I think I think maybe 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 more like a six actually. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, because yeah, well, uh, well, it was sort of you know all the words were there, right? But it, uh, it didn't sort of get me excited. Uh, I, I was actually just. It did lack the passion. I mean, but how much passion can there be for a municipal? Well, that's maybe site? a point. But I was I was actually thinking maybe it's unfair. Like why why don't why don't they just use uh, eBay? eBay? Yeah, um, that's, that's where the uh, compliancy and then more importantly the handholding comes uh, in. Uh, there you go. Sure, no, that, that actually makes sense, and, and right. well, maybe it's a company that eventually sells to eBay or something, but... Yeah. So I agree, the pitch was a, you know, I might even restate my pitch down to a seven after hearing that. Oh, it's sorry about point. that. <laughs> no, but you know what I'll say, well, this is all about helping the entrepreneur refine their pitch. Sure. Um, I think if you had an exciting example of something that got sold for too little, like you gave us an example that was um, hypothetical. You know, no, cars it's a, those, and, are real, those are real examples, in fact, the city of Boston uh, were, they were selling their cars for $250 a piece. Yeah, yeah. So, I said, look, oh, give us your two worst cars. They came back, gave us our two worst call, cars. They sold for a total of $6,000. So, right. that, so that's what you have to do is you have to, yeah. you, have to get, you have to lead with that example. That is an awesome example, but yeah. you didn't give that in the pitch. So you should say, when we did this for Boston, they were selling their cars for $250. We took two of those same cars. We got them $6,000. That's $5,750. That is 30 times the return just by using our platform. They're doing right. it wrong. We can get them to do it right. That's how I would say it, so it's a little more exciting. What do you think of the business? Um, you know, I just, I have so little knowledge of this part of the world. Yes. So I, I couldn't really say, you know, if, I mean, obviously, like there's well, you're a, a rich, massive. You're a rich guy now, thanks to Unity being worth a well, you know, I've, quarter I've not, billion dollars not really. right now. It's got to be, your company's worth <laughs> at a, least it's, a. It's paper money, right? Right, but I mean, the company's and not, at least. And not liquid, by the way. Well, and you're going to raise another round any day now, because <laughs> you, ra you raised your money two years ago. I'm going to guess you're going to get a hundred, two hundred million dollar valuation. We'll, we'll, in that we'll, range, we'll, we'll, we'll see. It's, you're definitely in the low nine figures now, aren't you? Um, you know, well, that's where it would end up. I, I'd like to think so, but yeah. you know, there's, there's no rush. No rush. Um, but, Except that the whole market could collapse again. 
Oh, but the Ga- Zach, you gaming, see- gaming is not going to collapse. No, but I'm, yes, that's true. Good point. Uh, like but we, we what about the valuations? The, we went through the, f- f- well, yeah, valuations. Well, I don't know. People are say, saying Shouldn't you take the money off the table now as quick as possible? Uh, it's too fun. With the market being <laughs> we're hot, we're hot, not, so hot? We're not going anywhere. <laughs> like we I really know, but why wouldn't you take down a quick $25 million and just put it and sit on it? I mean... The market's hot right now. Oh, like that? Oh, well, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Oh, okay. That um, that's my way of finding I'm a poker player. I just found out, <laughs> I just found out you're about to close a $25 million round and $150 million valuation because your left eye twitched. Um, okay, tell me uh, what uh, you think of the business idea, scale of 1 to 10. Um, 10 being Unity or Google. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or Facebook. Uh, uh, actually, I believe in it. So, 8 or 9. Eight. Okay, good. Yeah. Very good. All right, there you go. Uh, great job on the pitch. Uh, and thank you to everybody who helped on the episode. Uh, David, you were a great guest, actually. Really, Thanks. it's great to have a first-time entrepreneur who's had so much success. Most first-time entrepreneurs fail. You're well, a first-time entrepreneur, yeah, and you've got 125 persons. I actually companies. started a couple of companies before, but they really went so f- oh. so not far that I... I that you don't oh, bring I, them up? I, you leave them out of the file? Them. <laughs> this no, is my no. first company. <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. Weblogs Inc. is my first company. Yes. And this is my second. No, I'm, like, I'm, on my, I'm on my sixth now. Fifth or sixth. I mean, listen, oh. keep swinging the bat. Uh, okay, everybody, this has been a great show. Keep swinging the bat. That's the name of this episode. We'll see you next time on This Week in Startups.